Okay, so joining us on the line is Courtney Act. Now, if you don't know who Courtney Act is, she is one of the stars of season six of RuPaul's Drag Race. And I'll be honest, I didn't really watch this show until I saw her in a commercial. And I said, oh, my God, who is that? I had to start watching. So Courtney is joining us. And I mean, I am sort of an example of what happens when people get the opportunity to be seen on a show like this. Can you tell me a little bit about what that experience was like for you? Yeah, I mean, Drag Race is, is an amazing opportunity and experience to just showcase them. And I, you know, I feel like my whole my whole career led towards Drag Race in some way. I, 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 and I just wanted to put on the best show that I possibly could. So in the lead up, I, you know, I was just planning. Like, it, my house looked like a crime, um, you know, like a crime lab with like all of these bits of paper stuck up on the wall with like arrows pointing to different costume ideas and wig ideas and combinations and things. And, um, you know, the packing process was absolutely insane. I had all these giant, they said we could take five bags. They didn't specify the size or weight of the bags. So I had these five 54 gallon tubs that were filled with costumes. You could have fit like 10 corpses in them. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And, um, yeah, so going to the show, I was, I was just so excited and so prepared to just put on a really great show. Cause I mean, it's your whole drag race. Like, you know, you want to, you want to bring it. And I'm so happy with, you know, all of my runway looks and all of my performances on the show. It was, it was, it was really fun. And those wings. You know, and, and speaking of the wings, your outfits have been so fantastic. Where do you get these outfits from? Um, all over the place, over the years. I mean, I've been doing drag for 14 years, so I've kind of accumulated a lot of stuff. And then um, I made a lot of new stuff for the show as well. Um, I mean, those wings were from the show that I was in in 2005 in Sydney, Australia. And when I knew that I might be on Drag Race, I was like, I just made a list of all of the most fabulous things that I'd seen or you know, new existed, <laughs> and uh, and those wings were on that list. And I called a friend, and I was like, "Hey, what happened to those wings from that X Men show we did?" <laughs> and they were, you know, in in the middle of Australia somewhere, somewhere. Someone drove them to Sydney. Another friend sort of packed them up, and then another friend who works for Virgin Australia, the airline, you know, flew them over. And uh, I went and picked them up one morning at the airport at 6 a.m. And I was like, what am I doing? I don't even know if I'm on this show. <laughs> like, well, I'm at the airport. What's, what, are these, what are these giant wings? And then when it all unfolded, I was just like, ah, oh, my God. I'm so glad that I, I if, at every juncture where it got too hard, I was like, oh, I'm not going to bother. <laughs> and I'm like, no, do it. And I was so glad. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned all these fantastic outfits that you got an opportunity to wear on the show. If I hadn't had known uh, that you were you were wearing these outfits and you were playing a character or something like that, I mean, I think a lot of guys would hit on you. I'd probably hit on you. Do you get that a lot? Most definitely. Um, it's kind of, it's, it definitely happens a lot. Um, men... Yeah, I mean, you know what, there's so many different scenarios. Sometimes it's a man who has no idea. Sometimes it's a man who has no idea but just can't quite form the link between his brain and his pants to understand what he sees, so he goes in for a closer look. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating experience that I have because, you know, I get to live life on the gender divide, sometimes with Shane and sometimes with Courtney, and uh, getting to see how people react differently to both of us is really fascinating because some of these straight guys that hit on Courtney, yeah, you know, to be honest, would probably want to, you know, gay bash Shane just for you know being who he was. Like I, I put my, I, I go, I go out of the, the gay world and the drag world with a lot of the performances I do, and I'm in very mainstream kind of straight environments, and so, you know, usually if there's a straight guy in a gay club seeing a drag queen, you know, he's open to the idea. But when you take the drag queen and you put her in, you know, the straight environment, um, it's really fascinating to watch how it unfolds. Um, and in my, my one woman show, Boys Like Me, that I do, um, I, I talk about all those different sexual experiences, um, you know, whether it be the, 
the Marine that I met whilst waiting for my car in the valet line one night. Um, or, you know, there's all sorts of wild and wonderful stories that I always would recount to my friends and they would just find fascinating and hysterical. And I was like, I'm going to put these into a show uh, yeah. as a bit, of, a bit of an exploration of sexuality and gender. Now, I just want to jump back to to the show in that, you know, a lot of people who, fa- who, who heard we were doing an interview with you were saying that they watched you on the show or they know you or they've seen you perform, and they felt like the show did not portray you in a particularly great way, that you sort of came off as like a mean girl type. And I think Darian Lake really did you a service when he started to talk about the fact that you were sort of his mentor or you helped him through certain things on the show. Can you tell me a little bit about you know, how you feel you were portrayed on the show? Yeah, it was really funny because I drive every day. Um, I make it, I, I, I remember like a few years back, going, not a few actually, quite a, I remember quite a few years back thinking, I don't want to be a bitchy, mean gay because drag really, you know, it does have a subculture of, of bitchiness and, and all that sort of stuff. And I, I made that conscious decision not to be that person. And I do feel, you know, every day I kind of, I deliver somebody who's who's not bitchy and who's not mean or any of those things. And um, and I definitely do have, I'm definitely happy to be honest, though. And I think that my, my blunt Australian honesty was often taken out of context. You know, I, I, I obviously said all those things that I said, but they weren't the only things that I said, and they weren't necessarily delivered in the way that I said them. Um, so, you know, they're making a TV show. That's, that's understandable, but context has a lot to do with it. What happened either side of a comment, you know, when you edit in a pregnant pause or a, a slurp from a straw and a, and a side eye kind of thing, it can change the whole meaning. Um, but, yeah, definitely I, uh, I'm not a mean gay or a mean girl. Um, so it was, it was a struggle sort of around the comedy challenge week. It sort of started to take a turn, and um, it was a real struggle for me because I felt, I felt bullied in a way uh-huh. um, by what was happening on television because I, I just felt misrepresented and I felt, I felt awful because it was showing me, you know, being mean to Jocelyn, whom I absolutely love, um, and just sort of showing that mean girl thing. So that was, that was a real struggle for me um, and my own sort of self-understanding because, you know, I go through life, I'm very comfortable not caring what people think about me. I'm, you know, a drag performer who has been in the public eye in Australia for, you know, over 10 years. And I'm good at I'm good at not caring about what people think of me, but the real challenge came when everybody had an opinion of me that wasn't because of something that I actually did, if that makes sense. I put up a video on YouTube, um, an interview between myself and uh, trans performer and activist Our Lady J, um, discussing some of the controversial topics that had come to light because of the Rusical episode, the she male or female challenge, and discussing language and you know the word tranny and the word she male and and our thoughts and opinions on that. Somebody commented on that video on YouTube. I don't like Courtney Act. I find her this this and that. I didn't find any offense in that at all. I thought if you watch that video and you didn't like me, then that's completely fine. You know, you're we don't we don't not everybody has to like me. I get that. But when somebody puts a comment on YouTube saying, you know, I used to like you, Courtney. I used to think you were nice, but after watching you on Drag Race, you know, you're just mean or comments like that. Those ones get to me because I'm like, no, that's not who I am. And uh, it's that was a real challenge. But, you know, I look on the bright side and now I've got this jumping off point to, to really show America who, who I am. I think they saw who I am when it came to the runways and the costumes and all the performances I delivered, but um, now they'll get to to learn that Courtney's not a mean gay. She's she's quite the opposite. Mm-hmm. I hope. Now we do have some. Speaking of fans, we do have some audience questions that I wanted to throw your way. This next one is coming from Carolyn. She's in Connecticut, and her brother is actually a drag queen. 
and he thinks you are fantastic, and he wants to know if you could give him any advice on how to make his path a little bit easier, maybe, you know, to make him the next drag superstar. Well, hello, Carolyn in Connecticut. Um, you know, drag drag is a funny thing because it's kind of like it, it's the greatest thing and it can also be a real struggle. Um, drag taught me so much about myself because I had to let go of so much of what I had been told a man should be or what, you know, what was right or what was respectable. Um, and in that, and through that, I had to, I had to, come to understand who I was and have a greater love and respect for myself. Um, as far as performance side goes, drag is is fun and crazy and challenging. And my, my best recommendations when people ask for tips, I say go to YouTube and watch makeup tutorials, watch wig tutorials, watch other drag performers, um, and uh, I'm just kind of like, you know, if, it's, if you enjoy doing it, it has to be a passion. Drag is Drag, well, drag can be a hobby. It can be something that you do a couple of times a year for fun with your friends. And there are a lot of people who do love drag. In, in fact, a lot of, you know, my big mean gay friends who you wouldn't think would be caught dead, you know, in a pair of high heels in a week, they absolutely love it. Like every Halloween, they're all begging me to dress them up and, you know, they have such a fun time. So drag can, you know, be something that you do for fun. Or if it is your passion, if performing is your passion, and the drag and the creativity of your passion, then you know it'll it'll find you. You don't have to you don't have to worry too much. You, it, I think that drag queens, real drag queens, cannot be anything but drag queens. Um, you know, there's been times in my life where I've really struggled with it, thinking that it wasn't honourable or that it wasn't you know a respectable career in the younger years, obviously, and um, and I just couldn't stop. It just didn't matter how much my rational brain told me that I should be going to acting school or that I should be going to theatre school or, you know, getting a real job. I just couldn't stop. So drag kind of has a way of taking over whether you like it or not. Yeah. yeah. And, and you do look fantastic doing it, by the way. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that growing up there's this sort of uh, shame or this gay shame because we hear that over and over again in the community. And I also heard RuPaul talking about it. He was doing an interview and he said, you know what's interesting is that when he sells products, it's not gay people that, that buy the products. It's older women or mothers or these girls who are growing up and seeing the show and want to you know, wear his products, which I thought was interesting. And he pointed out the fact that he thought it was because of this shame that a lot of gay people grow up with having. Can you t talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, gay men, whether it's acknowledged or not, grow up with a great sense of shame. Uh, certainly, you know, when I grew up and, and before that, it's getting a lot better because all of the examples of sexuality that we're shown in society are heterosexual examples. Um, as I said, they're getting better now, so I'll just speak for when I was growing up. Um, when every loving relationship you see every even non non you know sexual relations every example of an individual or a human that you saw on television in pop culture in real life looking around was a heterosexual one there was no examples of of two men there's all of this emphasis and importance put on masculinity and being a man and women are women and men are men and there's a real polarizing aspect to sexuality and gender and then when you break out of that and you're like I'm going to go against the grain um you know, there's all of this contrary evidence to, to why who you are is not right. And um, and then there's all of the other issues of, you know, being accepted by family and friends and society and your work. And um, it, can, it can cause a lot of shame. I didn't realize that I actually suffered from any gay shame for many years. I was like, no, I'm completely well-adjusted and fine. And then I read this book called The Velvet Rage, um, which is a... a book written by a gay psychologist who specializes in gay clients, and it was just fascinating to read all about this kind of, this gay shame, as he calls it, that I, I, as I was reading, I was like, oh my God, I have totally, you know, for many years been living with this shame of being gay, and I never realized it because it just, 
it was just so normal and just so, you know, the way it sort of went. And so it was so wonderful to be able to unfold all of that and embrace my femininity, embrace all the facets of my own sexuality and gender and realize that, you know, it's not a binary thing. You don't just have to be a man and you don't just have to be a woman. You don't just have to be gay. You don't just have to be straight. And often your own expression lies somewhere on a spectrum um, in those two points. And that it's our, you know, our similarities are greater than our differences in the end, but it is that diversity and that difference that gives us such a rich and wonderful world. So we should celebrate all of those things that we're ashamed of because in reality they're the things that make us unique and wonderful. Well, let's talk because I also have another audience question and it's from Kim in Long Island and she wants to know what you think about facial hair in drag. And you can mention Milk who was on this past season and also... Um, and Peter West, who famously just won uh, the Eurovision Song Contest. Yeah. Matthew Anderson, RuPaul's makeup artist, hair and makeup artist for 20 years, has been doing bearded drag for decades and is just one of the most beautiful and fascinating creatures. His Instagram is a wonderful place to spend, you know, an hour just flipping through these photos. Um, and I love that there are so many different forms of, um, of drag and of expression. And if facial hair is your thing, then by all means, it's kind of, I think it works so well now because it's so shocking um, when a when a and when an audience sees Courtney that it's almost like they have to they're like hang on wait it's a it's a man it looks like a woman yeah but it's a man and their brain kind of goes okay and just kind of suspends belief but when a when a drag queen has these beautiful eyes fabulous hair and costumes and a beard. You, it's it's a lot harder to suspend belief yeah. when you're looking at that. So it kind of like shocks you into reality of of the of the not the fluidity of gender, but at least the it sort of mocks gender in some senses, which I think is a great thing because we're so stuck on the binary of gender when something really messes with gender like that. I think it's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And. And you've done so much in terms of this. You, you have you have a lot of stuff going on um, post season six. This will be my last question for you. What is next for you? Do you think? Well, I have always, you know, been a singer and a performer, doing live shows and releasing music. I've got uh, a bunch of different songs out, and uh, I've just released a new single, which is called Mean Gaze, which is a little bit of a t- a little bit of a, a, a tongue in cheek sort of uh, song, um, not about my time on Drag Race, but it's just a, you know, I have earned that reputation and I thought, you know, why not why not own it and redefine it? And uh, I, I've released a song called Mean Gaze, um, which has a really fun music video which has come out. It features good Courtney, salty Courtney, and innocent Shane, and, and that, that sort of pushing and pulling Shane through the, through the gay world and all of the muscle-bound you know, mean gays and scenarios and situations. And I'm, I'm really proud of the video that just came out and um, and the singles available on iTunes. So my plan is to keep performing, touring around the country, doing my, my one-woman show and my club shows and uh, working on an album, which will be coming out later in the year. All right, there you have it, Courtney Act. She's one of the stars of season six of RuPaul's Drag Race. It was a pleasure having you. And I'll be listening. I'll have to go out and buy that record. <laughs> 